Okay, so um, this is just an ad hoc meeting to talk about um, legislative priorities. We, um, I reached out to the Human Services Committee and invited them to our November 20th meeting. Um, I'm still working on getting some people to attend. I don't know if people didn't respond because obviously the election being yesterday, some of them were um, you know, up for election. So I'm gonna do you know, another reach out and, um, you know, invite. So depending on, you know, I know um, Rep Gilcrest got back to me and she cannot make the 20th meeting, but would said she would be happy to make herself available at another time. So if it ends up that we can't get um not like some legislators to join for the 20th the meeting on the 20th then we'll probably try to schedule another meeting um i'm hoping before session starts so maybe sometime early december we could schedule a meeting so i don't this is either going to be quick and we <laughs> do a presentation on the 20th or it's going to be a little delayed um while i get legislators to um, attend. So there was definitely interest. I just need to follow up with some people. So, so Terry, um, just to confirm, if it's not the 20th, you'll reschedule it. If it's not, the we'll still have our ASAC meeting on the 20th, but I will reschedule and get a time. Hopefully, I, I know everyone said they wanted to speak to them before session started. So um, this may be a good opportunity to do some outreach to maybe new um, people who are elected. So I, I just have to look at all of that. But originally I just sent it to the Human Services Committee um, because I figured they, they'd be the ones to, to look at, you know, primarily any bills that came through regarding, um, that had to do with autism. So there's a chance it could be additional, but um, people like from insurance or whatever, but, um, so I will continue to do that and try and get some people there for the 20th. And then um, what I need from this group is just because you guys are subject matter ex experts. And so I just need you guys to kind of look at what the group decided were priorities and create some type of presentation to show um, you know, maybe provide some background on why this is a priority for the council and then, you know, everyone can, you know, weigh in and um, however you guys want to do it is fine. Um, it, you know, it could be informal, um, just a short PowerPoint, but um, and then provide opportunity for legislators to ask questions to the group too, I think would be important. So um, I'm going to pull up, I'll share a screen and pull up the survey results so everyone can take a look at that. Everyone see that? Tara, I'm driving. Do you do you mind I'll, just... Um, I'll read it I to Lynn. I did see it yesterday. I apologize. Yeah, thank you okay. so much. I don't think you want me to see it and drive. No, you focus on that and I'll read it. Um, so right, we have thank you. 11 total responses and the top priority, um, I had everyone rank them um, from one to seven. So the top priority for, you know, out of the 11 responses was the wait list for the autism waiver. Um, so that would be number one. Number two was supportive housing for adults um, with autism. Number three is mental health supports for people with autism. Number four was support for family caregivers. Number five was community wait lists for in-home services. Number six was employment support. And number seven was workforce development to support um, autism services in the state. So Tara, five was community support wait lists for in-home services, is that what you said? Yeah, for ABA, ABA and home. And I can send this out to the group too in an Excel um, spreadsheet so you can okay. see the, the data. So 
so with regard to the the wait list um, challenges, you know that's a that's a, that's a section in itself. So, um, but I'm, you know, I recall discussions in the past about um, one of the barriers being that the entire amount um, allocated need to be, you know, what was, was I believe it was fifty thousand dollars. Somebody, please correct me if I'm remembering that wrong. And I know we had conversations that there are other state models. Um, that would, you know, so for example, if somebody's only using a portion of that, the remainder of that fifty thousand dollars would go unused and unspent, uh, and somebody else may be able to, you know, you might be able to get three people help out of one fifty thousand dollar allotment. And at the time, which was not last year, it was the year before, or even the year before that, the discussion was that that would require a state plan amendment, but. I, I wonder if that isn't something out that if that is my recall is correct, if that's something that we wouldn't want to talk about because I don't know how you know the dollars expanding and the people I you know I guess it depends on what the barrier is. Is the barrier the access to the the dollars to serve people, or is it the people who need to process and allocate those services? If that makes sense. Yeah, Lynn. I've also um, was you know, kind of curious too, because when you look at the average, I think this has been reported out publicly, but the average spend on the waiver is something like $24,000 or something exactly. like that. Yeah, I remember um, that. Yes. So that's an, av that's an average. I can look to see if I can get an updated number, but um, so that also leads me to question, you know, do, are we providing the right services in the waiver um because again you know you can go up to the fifty thousand dollar budget but i you know that was one of my initiatives that i was hoping to see would be to do some okay. survey surveying i should say of not only those who are currently receiving services but also who's on the wait list and just in general like a, a nationwide <laughs> not nation but a statewide yes. I should um, survey because, you know, I was, where, where are the unmet, me unmet needs, um, for those, for those people? Um, I know that some people are also using state plan, um, services like PCA while, you know, they're okay. also receiving waiver services. So, um, their budget may be, you, it's just that that's what they're using specific to the waiver. Okay. Yeah, I think this goes back even when Kathy Abercrombie was still around, you know, the years blend together. But I think, you know, we talked about that and I honestly don't recall what was the impediment was to moving forward with exploring it. But I view that as a way to expand services to more people without necessarily expanding the cost of doing so. Right. So, I mean, that would be looking at like potentially like a tier, another tier that we could do in a waiver amendment. Um, you know, we would need, obviously, we need to have DSS on board and see where they're at with, right. um, you know, considering some of this. I know that they were looking into some of that, um, but that would be, you know, one thing that we could be working with DSS on. Um, is tiering the waiver and or assessing yeah. um, services and supports and, you know, where are the unmet needs? I don't know, Melissa, if you have any thoughts on this, because I know you're providing those services. So I didn't know if you're, you know, what you see as far as like if there's unmet needs or, you know, waiver utilization dollars, kind of what the Yes, well, there was one uh, long standing provider who stopped providing as of November 1st. Uh, so that created, um, I mean, but a lot of people, you know, really tried to plan ahead for that and they gave, they gave plenty, mm -hmm. of, they gave some good notice. Um, and so uh, there's been a shift now. So we're now moving to new agencies where those of us who are providers on the waiver had 
of relationships with some of the staff people at, you know, at the prior agency. So now it's going to be a matter of like getting those relationships up and going again, um, making sure that folks are, are matched with life skills coaches and community mentors that are, you know, going to be good fits for them and things like that. So there's, there's definitely been, you know, a, a pause in that regard. Some families also choose to do private hire. So sometimes I see a delay in services because the family is really searching for uh, a private hire who will be a really good, you know, fit uh, for, um, for the individual. So that's, um, those are oftentimes uh, where I, where I do see the delays. Okay. Yeah, I, I have to say the case managers do an excellent job of referring in terms of the um, the social skills group. Um, I get very regular referrals uh, on the social skills, skills groups um, and for people who are either new to the waiver or not necessarily new to the waiver um, because I do a hybrid model. Uh, for groups, um, you know, I do have some individuals who attend from, you know, the northwest corner of the state, the Bridgeport area, uh, East Lyme area, you know, I do, I, I am able to capture, um, you know, a lot of folks because people can also come in person, but they can, mm -hmm. they can be online simultaneously the way I, I have my setup. So. And I haven't heard of a lot of people, um, at least for the, the for the autism waiver, um, besides the delay for in-home ABA, I haven't heard of a lot of delay for waiver services. Um, have you had any, like, have you heard of any people like who are qualified, you know, they have access to waiver, but they're waiting on supports and services. Is that because you said the provider, I know that that provider left, but I also know they picked up other providers. So yes, they did. They okay. Did. So my understanding was there's not really a wait for implementation of services once somebody's on the waiver, right? Yeah. I'm trying to think okay. if there's anything. No, I think the wait right now that I see is when there's a private hire okay. and the family's just trying to find the right the right match. Okay. Um, but otherwise, yeah, these new agencies that have come on board uh, do seem to have so far seem to have um, uh, staff ready to do the community mentoring okay. and, and the life skills coaching. And is there in your experience, is there anything that you're hearing that's an unmet need for those who are participating on the waiver? Like as far as services that they wish they had that they're not receiving. Oh, that they wish they had? Yes, um, that would be transportation to social events. Okay. And that's that's very different because if somebody comes to my group, they can access the MTM transportation because it's, it's or, or if they come and see me for individual therapy, they can access MTM transportation. Uh, through their, you know, the the transportation number on the back of the uh, of the Husky card. Uh, however, if you know, if they want to attend social events out in the community, that's where they can't utilize the MTM transportation, and that becomes that 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 is a barrier. I definitely see right now is transportation for for social events. Okay. All right. I think Yana has. Yeah. As far as with the agencies, as someone who's going through it and trying to find staff, it's very different from that point of view. I've had in one year, last in the past year, four different staff come through, and it was the four, and that was just up until July. And I'm pretty much right now. We're doing my folks and I are going through a private hire to get a community mentor. But I pretty much burnt out on the agencies because they can't seem to find anybody with staying power. And it's not the staff's fault. They don't pay the staff a living wage. So the staff are not motivated to stay on. When we do get great staff, they're not going to stay on at these jobs for 
long periods of time. They don't pay enough money. And from what I've heard from other staff, they say it's also a lot of driving. Mm. And it takes a, it's bad for their cars, it's a lot of driving. So we need to be paying our staff a living wage and retaining the really good staff. Because right now, our, a lot of the staff is using this job as a jumping off point to get a better job. And they don't stay around very long. That's And that's not fair to our individuals to have to constantly shuffle staff. And you do get burnt out, which is where I am right now, where I do need life skills, but I'm so burnt out at this point with having to switch people all the time. Because we know, and for autism experts, we know how well our individuals do with change. Not very well at all. So we really need to do better, especially when it comes to paying staff a living wage and retaining the good staff. Yeah, Yana, I agree with you. That that's a that's an important point. And I think I think what you said was was very valuable. That there are staff in there, but Yana is correct. Oftentimes, there is a there is a changeover. Yes, I. I should have spoken to that. I'm sorry. But yeah, but like, are there staff in place? Yes, there are staff in place. But Yana added to that and made a very good point that there oftentimes it is a, there is a, a, a changeover. And everything Yana said is what I hear as well. Like, well, so-and-so left because they're going to get a job that pays better or they're going here or going there. I mean, they, they do, yes, the individuals on the waiver do hear that from some of the life skills coaches and mentors. Thank you, Yana. That was really yeah. important. Right now, it's funny. Right now, I'm qualified to work with myself. I have a bachelor's degree. The only thing that stops me from getting a job as a DSP is the fact that I don't have a car or a driver's license. But, and I know I'm not the only one who's qualified to work with themselves because they have a degree. So I guess the question is, do should we, you know, as the council be advocating would you do you think we should be advocating for are we advocating for increase in waiver slots because of the wait list or should we be advocating for um you know a more of you know an evaluation of waiver services in order to you know maybe tear that out as a way to serve more people or are we looking to advocate for a rate increase um, for all of those things? <laughs> what are, you, what all, are your- All of the above, Tara. Yeah. I, I, think, I think we have to go look at some other state models and talk about tiering the services. And um, I, I, I do wanna bring up the pinch that we provide. And that is that we have to impoverish those who apply for the services, which makes no sense when the cap is 50,000. And these are individuals who are capable of being competitively employed, earning at least a minimum wage, which would then not impoverish them according to the standard. And I want to add private insurance could also be motivated to pay for some services and we do have a Connecticut law that actually inhibits certain services at age 21, after age 21, I should clarify. So we have some work to do on these double standards that almost prohibit, like we actually force the problem to exist. So if we could talk to our state legislators about un packing that and actually saying that in, if we want to improve the system, let's start with not demanding that people have to go through Social Security and Husky and actually talking about providing a continuum and a leveling of um, supports and services so that individuals that can retain competitive employment with a small amount of services can actually get supplemental services, dare I use that word, um, where maybe um, private pay or insurance can't supply. And can we please take a look at the Connecticut insurance laws 
to leverage those more to get the right services in place for that end. And then can we talk about housing and independent living in a manner in which we can supplement that as well? And we should be coupling this with the work that's being done in, under BRS because we act like this is the only option and it is not. Right, right. <laughs> and, and so we're not being efficient at all when in fact we have multiple options to be able to be providing this. And if we could just map out those options and where those barriers can be removed and there's some real low hanging fruit here. Um, so we can just bring their attention to that low hanging fruit and say, change the insurance law, talk about leveling the continuum, talk about those that are capable of becoming competitively employed and still allow under this leveling option to apply for a waiver um, where maybe we talk about how supports can be looking like for that. I don't know, just maybe I'm dreaming. Yeah, I Kim, well. I was, yeah, <laughs> I was thinking, I was actually, you know, you brought that up the last meeting and I was thinking about it um, from the insurance standpoint. And I was wondering if, like, if there's a way that we could look at getting what the cost would actually be to the insurance companies, if, because you figure, you know, if it's private, if it's private insurance, there's, you know, a copay and, you know, all of that. So even if, what are your thoughts? Cause this is, this is kind of my like out of the box. Like what, what if it would be, well, one, there's two things, sorry, my brain's moving too fast. <laughs> One is that what would that look like if we could get it approved through like when a child would leave their parents insurance like through 26. So would that be one thing to advocate for or what would it look like to get ABA as an of as an approved treatment um, for like no matter what the age. Um, so in your opinion, well, that's one thing. And then the second thing, based on what you said, was one thing that came to my mind was what we do kind of for the Katie Beckett waiver. So whereas it's a short term, I wonder if there's a way that we could say it's not like a long term support, but a short term transitional from, you know, it, if that would be something there would be an appetite for, um, you know, as a way to access supports and services, um, you know, through through what we have through the waiver. So just just asking kind of if that's what you were also, if that's in line with what you were thinking. Um, yes, to all the above. Again, I think if we can isolate even services going a step further, because um, Melissa mentioned and Yanya mentioned transportation being one of the biggest barriers. That's again a low hanging fruit. If we could like isolate, if you only need transportation, here is the option. If you need in home BCBA, here's the option. Because not we treat these services as if it's a one lump sum when it doesn't have to be. Um, it could be maybe parceled out. and. I might be able to do a little homework on the insurance I, just based on my immediate um, personal experience. I wouldn't actually be able to be generalized too much, but I can at least give you um, what it's costing on my end and give some preliminary understanding of that. It's almost like we need a matrix of services, right? It's not one size fits all. And how do we, you know, we uh, allow the um, structure to fit the individual instead of having the individual have to fit into the structure? And this would align with where the DD Council is going because they're trying to, to adjust for the level of need too and reshape and, and take away that hard IQ as being Again, that one size fits all, we all have to fit into this parameter. So if we even align our language with their proposal and saying we're going with a level of need, not a uh, one size fits all approach, I think we might have a better luck. 
so not a criteria based approach, but a level of need. Is that a fair way to put it? Yes, that's correct. And that's exactly what they're trying to do as well. Okay. Go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, just to, um, you know, also give people a sense of um, pri private insurance. I'm not, I'm not talking about Husky, but um, private insurance. Um, it can be very challenging to find uh, providers who work with the autism population who take insurance. A lot of my colleagues are not taking insurance anymore. And I also will say I have one insurance company that lowered my rates by $10 a session um, and another insurance, private insurance company that just lowered rates by $6 a session. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you multiply that by like 15 people a week, and then you multiply that by four weeks for a month, it, it adds up. Um, they, um, you know, yes, they raised like some other rates, but, <laughs> but then those rates, um, you know, tend to be watched and monitored more and audited a little bit more. Um, and so, you know, I think there's also, and I have to figure out how to do this, but educating insurance companies, and I try to do that when I get people on the phone, but to say that, you know, there's a lot of case management and phone calling and, and collaboration of care that goes into providing quality service um, that I firmly believe in and I stand by and, and still do. Um, but it is, it is painful that when you're doing all of this work and then you do work outside of the session to then be told that you're now going to be receiving $10 less a session, my concern is going forward, where are the people, like I'm 30 years in the field now, what's going to happen to folks who are interested in working with individuals with autism whose families do have private insurance you know <laughs> what are are they going to hop on board insurance panels this is something that i'm now concerned about so i just want to bring that to people's attention so kim i know like when you talk about like we need to get insurance companies on board i you know if there was ever a way to be able to speak to people at the insurance companies who make the rules and make the the and set the fee schedules i feel like there's so much psychoeducation that needs to occur i i totally agree melissa <laughs> So, um, you know, regarding the waiver, then, um, you know, again, this is more like for the council as a whole. And, um, you know, I think that legislators are really going to want to hear from you guys. Um, so, um, you know, however, w whatever route you guys feel is the best way to take, um, you know, I'm I'm just here to help facilitate. <laughs> the, yeah. So, uh, however you guys want to move forward is fine. I mean, Terry, you had indicated earlier about potentially getting some more information from people who are receiving the waiver services. Um, have you done that in the past? And is there an efficient way to do that? Um, so, what I was hoping for, and again, this would be a budget proposal because um, it would cost us about. Um, according to the estimates that I've received, about $150,000 to do. Um, but there is a, and I'll pop, I'll look it up and pop it in the chat. But um, I came from Pennsylvania, I come from Pennsylvania. So I worked in the um, adult autism waiver as a, you know, clinician um, for several years. And we did, we did a survey. Um, and we surveyed our waiver participants and we surveyed the state as a whole. We did um, a caregiver survey and, um, you know, an individual survey where we collected data on what waivers they were participating in, what were unmet needs, um, 
you know, and we were able then to use that data for planning and advocacy for legislators, increasing waiver slots, et cetera. Um, so I can share that what that looks like um, with you guys, but that was something that um, in my role, coordinating autism services across all state agencies, I don't feel like we have a solid understanding of, you know, DDS does a great job of, you know, kind of helping people with that transition. So if you have an IDD diagnosis, um, you know, the this you're kind of in that system and you're known to the agency and they, you know, do age out planning for um, high school and they're able to get people in, you know, um, day and employment. I know there's still some struggles for some people getting those services, but um, they're able to do, you know, budget requests and all of that based on that data because they have they know who's you know, coming in. All we have is a wait list. <laughs> um, and for the autism waiver specifically. Um, so that being said, you know, one of my job components was to, to evaluate the wait list and look at that. And I know DSS right now is doing some analysis on that wait list. They're doing outreach to see, um, you know, and I know Krista had to jump off, but she works really closely to see like, you know, oh, is somebody now, maybe they signed up and put their name in for the wait, you know, the autism waiver, but then say somewhere along the line, they get an IDD diagnosis. So now they're gonna go over to um, DDS instead of, you know, staying on that. And so th there's just some cleanup that we need to do to get an accurate number of how many people are waiting for those supports and services. Um, and so that was that was one of um, one of the things that I was trying to advocate for only because I feel like if we had accurate data and a state um, profile that that would be a really user friendly and there's a dashboard, there's a way that legislators and community members could look at that data to say, you know, this is what we have coming up. These are the amount of people that we need to start planning for. Um, and, you know, that that was just one tool that we had. And I haven't, if, if you guys know of data that I'm not aware of, I would appreciate it. But the only thing that we really have is education numbers of how many people, um, you know, have, you know, maybe an, a, an, a diagnosis, but even that isn't really broken out to, you know, for, it, that makes it really clear for planning purposes. Um, so that was one thing that I was bringing from my experience there that I was hoping to, you know, see if we could make happen, but. I mean, that sounds incredibly useful to me. I think sometimes that we struggle and uh, to get the data. And obviously we know that that really makes that coupled with the personal you know, stories from, you know, self-advocates or parents or whatever, I think can be really valuable. And I think it helps us in terms of future planning, right? We're not always just looking at what's right in front of us, but rather what's coming at us, right? Yeah, I agree right. with that. So um, I will, you know, hold on real quick. I, I can just show you guys what, what it looks like real quick. Um, but it was basically a needs assessment that we did. Um, on one second and then I can share my screen and you guys could um and Lynn I know you can't see it but I'll send you the link um so so this was the um so we did the autism needs assessment and one of the cool things that you can do is you can look at by county and you can see each county where it says the top service need in that county. Um, you can look at demographic information based on, you know, the number of people that responded. So it's, it is kind of a nice tool for legislators to see, you know, who responded in their county and what, what those needs look like. Um, as you know, they hear from a lot of people and sometimes there's varying levels of information. 
Um, so that's, you know, one of the ways that the data is um, displayed oh, and then it has overall statewide data. And then the other thing, um, I'm sorry, go back up. They put it into the um, life course model um, in each, which is something that we use in Connecticut as well to look at like, for example, day in employment and then what, what that data looks like. Um, mm -hmm. So looking at if people are, you know, currently employed, what age group they're in, all of that. So that was that, that 150 would be for, um, all of it, like this dashboard, the, you know, all of the surveys and collecting all of that data. And Tara, how did you identify uh, who you targeted to be respondees? Um, we sent it out to um, all, you know, everyone in, in the uh, system. It was a statewide, you know, they sent it out on all of the websites. And um, so it was, they we've done it they did it for a couple of years now so the first you know every year they've gotten more um more and more respondents so i think let me see the last one was 2010 um or no sorry 2018 and that didn't act that didn't like i appreciate your comment earlier about um providers and getting provider input as well. So I understand yeah. this targeted individuals and their families. Um, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see if we could also, also capture feedback given some of the comments today about mm -hmm. providers. Yeah. I just wanted to say, to, oh, hold on. Let me lower my hand. It was nice and all, but the more time, it's time for real action. Our parents are, we have individuals whose parents are not getting any younger, who are living at home, who if we don't act very soon. We're going to have, I keep saying this, and we're, we're at a precipice right now. And we're in a very dangerous space with our individuals who have aging parents, they're living at home. And if we don't act, Soon, and I mean soon, we're going to have individuals in the shelter system. And I don't think that's what we want. Vulnerable people on the autism spectrum in the shelter system because our people are being left out of housing. IDASH is wonderful, but we're left out of that one. And we don't need 24-hour support. We need more social support where there's a couple of us living in the same building, supporting one another, doing social events mm -hmm. together maybe having a social skills groups in the community room, in the building, so that we're all together in one room instead of on computer screens. We need yes, action, so. we need, and we need good, affordable, transit-oriented housing so that our individuals can be independent as possible. Because from transit transportation, we have a lot of people living in transit deserts where there is no transportation. Mm -hmm. And we gotta get these folks out of that. It's moved into good, safe, affordable, transit-oriented housing where they have access to a bus line. They can be as independent as possible. That's one of the problems with the IDASH, by the way, is that there a lot of their housing is not transit-oriented, which yeah, I don't and, like and it I all. will yeah, and I will have an update, um, Yana, soon. But there is, as far as supportive housing is um, concerned, that there is some progress on that. Um, for a small, and I mean small, but it's something, it's a start, <laughs> um, a small pilot program for supportive housing with autism that I'm working on. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to have some more solid information on that, um, coming up, but yeah, cause we need to start acting cause and yeah. it's, I'm beginning yeah. to get sick and tired of all of the, I talk about it year after year after year and everyone smiles and nothing happened. And yep. we're on a precipice right now. We're going to have individuals going into the shelter systems. Not, not everybody has family that, that can depend on them. So we need to start acting. It's not 
it's not something that's overly difficult for our population. We don't need 24-hour staffing. We just need social supports. Yep. I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. And it's been I'm, done. I'm, there I'm are real, a lot of models out there. I'm real close, Yana. Give give me give give me a few more weeks. I'm hoping to um have some something uh, accomplished there mm -hmm. as far as supportive housing is concerned. I wish the state had money to. I wish to, we had to, to, to do some visits to the too. Scandinavian nations where they have the communal housing model because I think that mod I really love that model for our individuals. Too bad the state doesn't have the kind of funding send a couple of us over to Norway and Finland to visit these places. <laughs> um, so for, you know, for the, yeah, I'm going to jump back to the, the waiver as that was the number one priority based on the survey. So, um, you know, Kim, is that something that you, I know that you kind of on the side mentioned to me that you're willing and you and Patrick are willing to kind of do some of the heavy lifting on this. So is that something that you feel confident mapping out? I am happy to help get information and data, um, whatever, you know, resources you guys may need. Um, and I do think that if, if we're going to take the insurance approach, we should reach out to the ins insurance committee um, and invite them to the to the meeting as well, if you guys feel that that's relevant. I think it makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I obviously I would like your help, Tara. And yeah, Patrick and I had, I was had conversation around this and we're willing to do whatever is needed. Tara, I do think we need to be when you're talking to legislators, as you know, you need to be really clear on your ask mm -hmm. and really clear on how it can be um, improving and benefiting, not just an ask. So I think we need to be clear on, I mean, the autism waiver is big. So what's our ask? And, um, you know, where do we want to go? Because there's a million things I know I'd like to clarify. Right. Well, and I think that again, there could be some, there could be some work we could do as a council with, with DSS. And, you know, if it's just, um, you know, if we're not asking for funding, if we're talking about, can we restructure the waiver to serve more people? I think that's something that we would need to just work with DSS with. Um, if we're talking about increasing um, age on insurance for coverage. Like we talked to like, you know, Kim, I just threw that out there. Like if, what if we could get it to 26, like while, you know, someone's still covered on their parents' insurance, would that help close that gap so that while they're in college, while they're looking for a job, you know, that those services would still be available through, you know, private insurance. Um, how will that impact Medicaid, um, you know, and all of that too, we would need to talk about that, but, you know, um, that would need a, obviously we would need a state law to, to do that. So that would be policy work. Um, so I don't know, which, what are you guys thinking? And then waiver, additional waiver slots would be legislators too. So that would be, um, so that would be a budget ask my, mine, um, my idea of doing the survey, that's a budget ask. So, yeah. uh, we could, unless you guys know someone who's willing to write a grant with me, because <laughs> that would be the only other way that we might be able to get it done. Right. I mean, I certainly hear Yana's urgency and I certainly understand that given, um, prevalence rates and the needs that are out there in the community. But I feel like we're, it's, uh, to some degree, you know, as a group, we're throwing darts a little bit um, about what to focus on. Um, and, you know, I, I would certainly want a little bit more information if we were going to make priorities, if we were going to say, you know, all right, so we have a survey of, you know, nine people who said, here are the priorities. I, I, I don't feel com comfortable or confident saying that's the direction we should be pushing our legislators 
uh, I think, you know, I would want more confidence in how we're making these decisions and how we're making these priorities. So do you think that it would be a better approach than to, I, I think we could take a couple of different approaches to, in this presentation. One, we could just introduce ourselves as the council. We could, um, you know, kind of discuss some of the, you know, barriers and, you know, things that we, um, you know, as a whole, collective whole, me, we, I'm saying we as a collective whole, as a council, everyone has unique experiences. We have parents, we have, um, you know, lived experience, we have, you know, service providers, you know, looking for them to use us more as a resource as they're developing policy, or do we want to say as a council, this is our ask, um, and, you know, come up with a few like I know Lynn has always said this, you, you know, we would love to ask for all of the things, but um, you know, if there's, you know, one or two asks that we can focus on, I think that would be that would be best. So what's realistic is an ask for um that's based on the priorities. Yeah, I think it's important. Yeah, I think a couple to prioritize is important because I also I think they always, the people who are, are involved and have been supportive of us all along, I think some things resonate more with them. So if, if you know, the two or three things we ask for are all, we feel like if we can get one or some of those is a win, then as long as we put our priorities out there, whatever we get is going to at least move our, move us forward. Do you know what, what I'm saying about with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Tara, I like your idea of like maybe like re assuming some people maybe knew. I'm not sure. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of returning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that looked like there were a lot of. There's a lot of returning. Yeah, <laughs> but um, maybe we do like a, you know, just so basic understanding of the council, the legislative mandate of the council. And um, I think some of the leading concerns, um, barriers that we're discussing, and uh, if if we, uh, I I you know if we ask anything to us, maybe it's that we're still struggling to find a a key way to gather data and make it really you know, user-friendly and obvious, because I think if there's any takeaway I would like to make sure that they have is that this is a growing problem. This isn't a, this isn't, we're not going to, we're not going to resolve this problem. It's going to increase. <laughs> well, yeah. it's growing and it's complicated. And it's complicated. You've mentioned multiple state agencies. You've mentioned insurance agencies, uh, families, individuals i mean it's so diverse and, and complex yeah. yeah and maybe that's like that maybe that's how we close like key takeaways is that it's a growing problem it's complicated it's um and we would like them to think of us as sort of an expert panel for them to consult with i don't know just spitballing some ideas but yeah um, okay. You know, because that's why we're here. I mean, it, we're here, you know, in, in an advisory capacity and, um, you know, and I know the last session was a short session, but, you know, the council was not utilized or, you know, reached out to or nor did we have. Engaged, right. yeah. It, yeah, we didn't have a lot of engagement with, you know, legislators. So this, you know, this was my first um you know, attempt to kind of do some outreach. So I, it is up to you guys. I'm here to help in whatever capacity and facilitate that. But, um, you know, I, I definitely think that they need to know, you know, maybe know the level of expertise because not everybody has a nominating role, you know, so there's a lot of people who are doing the work and writing bills that, you know, impact this community and, you know, the, we're here as a resource. Yeah, I think that sounds like a good first step, especially since there's kind of a lack of a history of utilizing 
this resource. And Gemini, you may know, like, the, I don't know, because I was not engaged, you know, in years past. So, I mean, have we had more contacts in the past with legislators? I mean, since Kathy's been gone or? I no, I was just going to say Lynn will. will not probably, since Kathy's been gone. Even, yeah. even more history. Yeah. But Kathy was really our lifeline, you know, to. Okay. Because she was su such a, a, a fierce advocate you know, for this population. Um, and yeah, we haven't had a chance to, to, you know, bend, bend the ear of this committee, um, in, you know, in total. Okay. Do we know if Rep um, Exum is, is able to be more engaged this year? Because she, there, you know, there was a time where she, when she was able to be present more on the council, I think, she has a good understanding, and I think the hope was always that she would, you know, evolve into the supporter that Kathy was for this population. Yeah, I I haven't heard. Um, I can reach out and see if um, if she's, you know, what role she would like to play. That I think that would be great. Okay. At least she starts certainly with a foundational understanding, uh, certainly of autism, but also just of the committee's work. And I and I, mm -hmm. I think it would be she would be a great addition. Okay. It, and Tara, I would say, yeah, I would agree with Lynn. I wouldn't want. Um, is she on the committee still? I'm looking for her name. Um, she was. Um, this, the speaker appointed. Okay. Somebody else. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that so doesn't would... preclude her from being engaged and involved. Not, um, okay. I was looking at the human services committee. I didn't see your name. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I'm not looking at the right list, but no, I wouldn't want to get in front of this committee without her being read in. It was all I was going to say. We, we absolutely need her to, to, you know, brief her prior. She may even give us some you know, suggestions on how to, like Lynn was saying, how to order, you know, which way we go and how we present it, so forth. Um, if there's any pre-read materials and then, um, you know, it, it, and encourage those those committee members um, that can make it, that, they, that they're there for it. Yeah, I think that, you know, I don't think that we have to have anything like, I, I just would, I mean, I was thinking more humans, I, I reached out to the human services committee first because I thought, you know, that, that would be a good place to start and to, you know, considering that they're not utilizing us and, you know, Kathy's absence, then, you know, that was kind of my thinking. Um, but Kim, I do think that it's important we get insurance on as well, because there is, you know, obviously a big component to that. Um, you know, and I'm I'm happy to reach out to, you know, whoever um, and extend that invite. Um, but I do think them. I, I the more I think about it, I think that just having a general presentation of um, how the council is, you know, the legislation that you know mandated the council. Um, you know, and why we're here and, you know, kind of, and I do think though, that we should have some ask or some, um, even if the ask is, you know, we would like more participation or, you know, to, to advise or whatever, whatever you guys feel is the ask. But I also think there has to be some advocacy, um, you know, for some of the other things that you guys feel are priorities. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping supportive housing think, is something I get done, but again, um, yeah. you know, some of the other stuff we're going to, we're going to need advocacy. Right. Right. Yeah, I think we can, uh, along with, you know, what you have proposed, which I think is the right approach in terms of, you know, introducing the council and reminding people of why we exist. We're here as a resource. I think if we can even just say to them, you know, we, um, we, these are, you know, these are some of our, our initial priorities. You know, we may refine them. 
but we want you to at least be introduced to what, because these represent our areas of greatest concern or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they, they begin to hear it because, you know, they're going to, some people are going to, it's going to resonate with them. They've heard it before. Others are going to be like, wait a minute, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Can you tell me what the wait list is? (laughs) We don't, you know, there's all different levels of understanding. Um, So I think getting it in front of them, even if it's not a, you know, you're, we're not asking them to do anything just yet. We're introducing what we think our priorities are. And where the greatest impact would be. It's well put. Right, right. So um, next steps then, um, Kim and Patrick, if you guys want to, um, to, you know, maybe take a first stab at putting some of this together, I'll send you the data from the survey. And, you know, the, um, I can send you all of the legislative um, changes, like, you know, it's an OPM now, and the statute that coordinates with that. um, And you just kind of all of that, like background information. Um, You know, I know that there was, you know, the a, the study that was done initially that, like, you know, was used to advocate for developing the autism waiver to begin with. Um, that is so outdated. I think that, you know, to do a, again, not plugging my idea, but to do a survey or to collect additional data to see, okay, where are we at now? That's been, you know, I don't think that we've, we have that. Um, and the reality is, is that autism is going to touch a lot of families in the state. Um, it already does. I'm, you know, and it's, it's going to, um, that's not changing anytime soon. So I think that, you know, have having some, uh, you know, thoughts and I'm willing to be whatever support you need, um, to get that data and to help put that together. Yeah, if you can send me all that background and that data, that would be really great. And then um, I'm more than happy to take a, um, a stab at drafting it. And then if we could work with you, Tara, to kind of finesse it a little yeah, bit and make sure it's sure. on the right page. Yeah, and we're certainly open to collaboration from people who have been on the council longer than we have. Yeah, I know that there I've I've you know there were some people who you know reached out to me and said that they were interested in participating they just couldn't attend um today but I also know sometimes when we're like to take a first stab at it sometimes it's better with fewer people and then we can you know present it so maybe we get another yeah. meeting on the books to before the 20th um so Kim if I I, I can get you guys that day. I can pull that together and have it to you by, you know, tomorrow. But what is a good time frame if we're looking to set up another meeting um, while, you know, we have interested parties here? If we want to look at the schedule and see. Yeah, yeah we have to do it really sometime late next week, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, it starts the election then following is the 18th, even if it's a half hour, if we have the material ahead of time or, right. you know, just to kind of take a peek and yeah. Yeah, because I, I'm going to focus on getting, um, um, you know, people to the meeting. Right. I, I can have some, I can have a you know, work with Patrick and we can have something like by the end of next week, Thursday, Friday. I don't know what Patrick's schedule looks like. My, I have uh, open slots, let's just say <laughs> <laughs> Thursday and Friday. <laughs> yeah. That's not, not so much Friday morning, but Thursday is better than Friday. Thursday, yeah, Thursday's better than Friday there for me as well. Okay. So if we do something Thursday afternoon, that might be that might be best. Thursday afternoon. Kim, does that work for you? Yeah, so that's better for me. For some reason my schedule's not coming up on my computer, so I'm gonna just look at my phone real quick. 
So you're saying next Thursday? Yeah, the 14th. 14th. Um, yep, I'm free. Whatever time works for you guys. Do you want to just propose three o'clock similar to this meeting time? That work for everyone? I can't no, do three. I can't do three. Two? Two, but not three. Would two o'clock work for you guys? Yeah. Two, two o'clock works for me. Yeah. Okay. So then um, that will be a time that we um, present like what we have so far and then kind of um, get everybody's feedback on what needs to be, if, if we hit the mark or what needs, what else needs to be included. And that's the 14th, correct? I just want to correct. verify the date. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. And I'll send out a calendar or, you know, Zoom link. And Tara, you can break down like the money aspect of it for me too, right? I think that should be included. Yep. Um, what's being expended. Do you have, um, is that 100% federal dollars that's being expended on the waiver or is there some state funding provided it's for state? It? So we get federal match. Um, so okay. you, so the, you know, at like 50% typically. Um, so every dollar we spend as a state, we get federal match on that. Okay. So, so uh, just, I think it would be helpful for them to know just to not to assume they know that and to be able yes. to provide all that. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. Yep. Because again, um, I can tell you anything that would be a hundred percent state funded is going to be really tough. Um, especially a bit this is a budget year. So you're, you know, we can ask, but <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be um tough to get additional funding this year. Um so, all right. Thanks, Yana, for joining. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask. <laughs> well, mean... I'm not suggesting we ask. I just wanted to break it down and show them yep. where the funds come from. Yep. I'll get I'll get all of the um, data from, and and I do think it's important for them to understand, like also the landscape. I know that we're talking about focusing on the waiver, but. Um, you know, the reality is, is there's, there's a ton of need in, in home. There's a ton, you know, there's, there's a lot going on in this community, um, and across the lifespan. Um, so even aging, we haven't really even, nobody talks about that a whole lot. <laughs> um, but that's for another day. Um, I'm getting out of myself. We will, uh, I'll give you all of that data, whatever I can pull, whatever you want. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to, to kind of pull that together for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? All right. Good deal. Thanks very much. And then Kim okay. and Patrick, I'll follow up with you guys. And then, uh, the rest of you will see you next Thursday at two o'clock. Great. Thank you. All yeah, right. Good. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank Have a great day. Bye. Bye.